And now we'll have the, the last presentation from this session. Uh, to be the presentation from Sebastian Kaufman. Sebastian is currently Privat Docent at the University of Freiburg, the faculty of Neue Deutsche Literatur. Like uh, Katarina, Sebastian participates in the research project Nietzsche Kommentar based at the Heidelberg Academy of Sciences and until the end of this year, I think, he will offer us a new volume of the commentar dedicated to the gay science. Uh, Sebastian has already published a very interesting volume uh, in the commentar collection on ideals from Messina in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, Sebastian. So please, welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, it's possible to, um, to show my handout? Yeah, of course. Perfect. Okay, so hello um, all together uh, from my summer vacation, which I spent in Italy near Genova. And obviously uh, that fits very well to my um, Today topic for, I would like to present some thoughts on a section from Nietzsche's Gay Science, um, the work that Nietzsche wrote, at least partially uh, in this area, in the neighborhood in winter 1881, 82, before he later published a second extended edition in 1887. If all goes well, um, my commentary on that work will be published uh, not this year, but next year with almost 2000 pages in two volumes, but don't be afraid in the following 15 or 20 minutes, I will give you only short insight into a small, a very small part of my commentary. Specifically, my talk is about section 70 from the Gay Science. Um, and this text is uh, from the first edition, namely from book two which deals with questions of art, of the artists and connected with this, the women. I will first read the text in the German original and then in Walter Kaufmann's English translation. Um, then I will present some reflections on the genesis, uh, the context and uh, some interpretation problems of this short but uh, difficult text. Here is the German text, which you can find on my handout. Die Herrinnen der Herren. Eine tiefe, mächtige Altstimme, wie man sie bisweilen im Theater hört, zieht uns plötzlich den Vorhang vor Möglichkeiten auf, an die wir für gewöhnlich nicht glauben. Wir glauben mit einem Male daran, dass es irgendwo in der Welt Frauen mit hohen, heldenhaften, königlichen Seelen geben könne, fähig und bereit zu grandiosen Entgegnungen, Entschließungen und Aufopferungen, fähig und bereit zur Herrschaft über Männer, weil in ihnen das Beste vom Manne über das Geschlecht hinaus zum leibhaften Ideale geworden ist. Zwar sollen solche Stimmen nach der Absicht des Theaters gerade nicht diesen Begriff vom Weibe geben, gewöhnlich sollen sie den idealen männlichen Liebhaber, zum Beispiel einen Romeo, darstellen. Aber nach meiner Erfahrung zu urteilen, verrechnet sich dabei das Theater und der Musiker der von einer solchen Stimme solche Wirkungen erwartet, ganz regelmäßig. Man glaubt nicht an diese Liebhaber. Diese Stimmen enthalten immer noch eine Farbe des Mütterlichen und Hausfrauenhaften und gerade dann am meisten, wenn Liebe in ihrem Klange ist. Now, the English translation of my namesake, Walter Kaufmann, you can also find it on the handout. Women who master the masters, a deep and powerful alto voice of the kind one sometimes hears in the theater can suddenly raise the curtain up upon possibilities in which we usually do not believe. All at once, we believe that somewhere in the world there could be women with lofty, heroic and royal souls capable of and ready for grandiose responses, resolutions and sacrifices, capable of and ready for rule over men because in them the best elements of man, apart from his sex, have become an incarnate ideal. The intention of the theater, to be sure, is not at all 
that such voices should create this notion of women. What they are supposed to represent is usually the ideal male lover, such as Romeo. But to judge by my experience, the theater regularly miscalculates at that point, as does the composer who expects that kind of effect from such a voice. Such lovers are unconvincing. Such voices always retain some motherly and housewifely coloration, most of all when they make one think of love. Despite or rather because of the complexity of this text, the previous research on Nietzsche could not do very much with Gay Science 70. The few interpretations form generally spoken two opposite positions. While Jacques Leride and Rosalind Diprose read the section as evidence of Nietzsche's anti-feminist attitude, the reading of Uschi Nussbaumer Benz leads to the rather contrary conclusion that Nietzsche dreamed here of a female counter Alexander the Great. And Francis Nesbitt Oppel writes that gender roles might be reversed in this text. Jennifer Hudgens even speaks of a shockingly progressive claim in Gay Science 70, which she describes as follows. Nietzsche admits the possibility of higher women, but finds that media representations of women discourage society from seeing women as capable of higher things. Willow Werkirk compiles the text with sections 60 and 74 of the Gay Science into a triad that according to Werkirk, allegedly shows that women are required to act out the character to gain a man's love. But let us take a closer look at the text to form our own opinion. Is it a misogynistic text or a text that shows Nietzsche as a feminist author? Or is neither one nor the other view correct? To answer this question and generally to understand the text better, I think it is helpful to look at the textual genesis. Fortunately, we have a preliminary stage, or as Montinari calls it, a Vorstufe from autumn 1881, which is uh, not published among the so-called posthumous writings, but only, or posthumous uh, fragments, but only to find in the manuscript booklet M35. This earlier version of the text mentions a concrete name behind which the Italian opera singer Marietta Biancolini Rodriguez, 1846 to 1905, is hidden. Furthermore, the preliminary stage seems to be a bit clearer than the printed version. In any case, the posthumous text considers the real existence of great, even regal or royal women as possible, which is not at all said in Gay Science 70. You can find this Vorstufe also on the handout, both the handwriting and the transcription. Again, first the German original. Von königlichen mächtigen Frauen habe ich bisher allein einen Begriff durch Altstimmen auf dem Theater bekommen, zum Beispiel durch die Biancolini. Zwar sollten sie nach der Absicht des Theaters gewöhnlich nicht diesen Begriff, sondern den von männlichen Liebhabern, zum Beispiel von Romeos, erwecken. Aber dies taten sie bei mir niemals. Ich hörte immer das mütterliche Hausfrauenhafte hindurch, aber die ganze hohe Seele des Weibes, eine Fähigkeit zu grandiosen Entschließungen, Opferungen, Entgegnungen, Plötzlichkeiten, klang mir aus solchen Stimmen heraus, ein Ideal, dem gewiss auch hier und dort in der wirklichen Welt mehr entspricht als ein Stimmenklang. I, I try to translate this preliminary stage, this Vorstufe into English. I got a concept of royal, powerful women only through alto voices on the theater, e.g. through the Biancolini. It is true that, according to the intention of the theater, those voices were usually not supposed to evoke this idea, but that of male lovers, e.g. Romeos. But such alto voices never did this with me. I always heard the motherly, housewifely through it. But the whole high soul of the woman, her ability to make grandiose resolutions, sacrifices, responses, suddenness sounded to me out of such voices, an ideal to which certainly here and there corresponds more in the real world than a sound of voices. The example of Romeo, which is also, also cited in the printed version, 
can be determined more preci precisely against this background. This example does not refer to the Romeo role from Shakespeare's famous love tragedy, which in Nietzsche's time was only exceptionally cast with female actors, but to that from Vincenzo Bellini's opera seria I Capuletti e i Montecchi, whose libretto was written by Felice Romani and that was first performed in Venice in 1830. Marietta Biancolini not only made her debut in this opera in 1864 with the role of Romeo, but she sang it repeatedly and achieved worldwide fame in this role. For example, in the year of the publication of the first edition of the Gay Science, 1882, the journal Signale für die musikalische Welt reported on the singer's great successes in this role. However, Nietzsche never mentions her otherwise, unlike Bellini, who appears by name, for example, in Gay Science section 77. In his letter to Heinrich Köselitz of November 6, 1881, Nietzsche writes from Genova that he had visited Bellini's Giulietta e Romeo, as he calls the opera, four times in the theater there, presumably with Maria, Marietta Biancolini as Romeo. It is remarkable that only a few years later in his writing Jenseits des Gotthard from 1888, Josef Victor Wiedmann, who came forward in 1886 with a review of Beyond Good and Evil that was enthusiastically received by Nietzsche, describes the effect of Biancolini, whom he, Wittmann, saw and heard in 1885 as Romeo. Perhaps the passage where Wittmann mentions Marietta Biancolini's play as Romeo in Bellini's opera is not least an intertextual reminiscence on section 70 of Nietzsche's Gay Science. You can find this quotation from Wittmann also on my handout. I won't read the German original, only my English translation. It was fitting that, as Wittmann writes, just as we were in Verona, the Ristori Theater, after it had been closed before the end of the season due to a wave of influenza, what reminds us on our current Corona situation, was opened again and Bellini's opera Montecchi at and Capuletti was performed. As is well known, the Romeo is sung by a lady, but such powerful alto voices as the contralto of Signora Biancolini Rodriguez simply do not grow on our side of the Alps, just as oranges do not grow here. No tenor known to me could have competed in terms of male strength with a voice like this. The artist celebrated her highest triumphs in those powerful moments when Romeo, in fighting courage, confronts his enemies in a challenging manner, or when the pain for those who had been snatched from, his, from him unleashed his wildest despair. The theater thundered from the tumultuous applause at such moments, and we ourselves did not find these raging outbursts of applause exaggerated. Wittmann, thus, uh, thus judges the female male role quite differently than the speaking we or the speaking I in Nietzsche's text, according to whose own aesthetic experience, the opera composer miscalculates, who expects from an alto voice the effect of an ideal male lover. Interestingly, or rather tricky, the concluding statement, such lovers are unconvincing as they are too motherly and housewifely, is not meant to be radically disillusioning. Rather, this confirms the other before mentioned theater illusion, which is based on these alto voices. According to Gay Science 70, we do not believe in their masculinity, which the opera wants to persuade us to listen to. However, hearing those voices, we do believe in the existence of heroic and royal over masculine women in whom we usually outside the theater, as the printed version notes, more, more skeptically than the preliminary stage, do not believe. This illusion is therefore certainly created even though the theater or composer does not intend it at all. One does not believe in the ideal male lover, which is to be presented here, but in the best elements of men, which in those contralto voices have unintentionally become an incarnate ideal only apart from the male sex and thus also apart from sexual love. 
To come to a conclusion, in my opinion, the text neither provides proof of Nietzsche's misogyny nor of his feminism. Instead, it raises the question why the speaking eye in the theater, contrary to the artist's intention, wants to believe in the possibility of heroic royal women ready to rule over men that he otherwise does not believe in. Finally, this also raises the question of the relationship of this text to the philosophical tradition of gender theory avant la lettre. What in gay science 70 is placed under the sign of the theater and opera illusion, namely that somewhere in the world there could be women capable of and ready for rule over men. This was conversely downright commonplace in the philosophical gender theory of the late 18th, early 19th century. Women were indeed regarded as mistresses of the male masters. For example, Kant writes in his Anthropology or in his Anthropologie in Pragmatischer Hinsicht, 1798, the woman wants to rule, the man wants to be ruled, primarily before marriage, hence the gallantry of the old knighthood. And in the section on women of Schopenhauer's Aphorismen zur Lebensweisheit, first edition, 1851, one can read similarly, though without premarital specification, man strives in everything for direct dominion over things, either by understanding them or by conquering them. But the woman is always and everywhere referred to a merely indirect dominion, namely by means of the man as which she alone has to dominate directly. Another question then would be how Nietzsche's text relates to this philosophical gender tradition for which further examples could be given. More precisely, in what respect and for what reason um, Gay Science 70 devi deviates from this traditional way of modeling the relationship between ruling female and ruled man. But unfortunately, there's uh, no more time for discussing that question now. Perhaps we can discuss this together or um, perhaps one of you has already an answer to this question. I would be very glad for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sebastian. For, for, it's, it's a really interesting topic. And I think that dialogues with the current research of some of, of the speakers and participants who are here today. So we are open uh, again to uh, the questions. Stop the sharing. I think Scarlett yeah, Martin yeah. has a question. Yes, Scarlett, maybe. Please. Okay. Thank you very much, Sebastian, for your talk. Uh, very interesting for me because I'm uh, dedicating myself to the relationship between Nietzsche and the and women. Well, and uh, the paragraph 70 belongs to a sequence of paragraphs where Nietzsche talks about women, a sequence uh, which begins with the paragraph uh, 57 and finishes with the paragraph 75 uh, of the second book of the Gay Science. I think that uh, scholars in general have not given enough attention to this sequence among other reasons, because they have considered problems regarding knowledge to be central in the first parts of gay science. Uh, I mean, scholars have not given enough attention to this, uh, to this sequence concerning uh, women, yeah? concerning uh, Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's observations about women. And, um, I would be very glad to listen to you about this point. In the second book of Gay Science, well, in the first one, Nietzsche discusses the status of knowledge and belief. In the second one, he goes on to address 
kinesiological problems. Well, uh, why the, the sequence about women can be found exactly in the middle of the, of the, the observations uh, about knowledge, the gnosiological observations, the gnosiological considerations. I, I'm not sure I was clear. Mm -hmm. It's a question concerning the place, uh, place in which uh, the paragraph 70, the place uh, which paragraph 70 occupies in the second book of the gay science. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure if the context is about uh, knowledge, um, but um, as you know, um, the uh, main topic of the second book is um, um, the aesthetics, um, the question of art, the question of, um, um, of the artists, and um, there's a relation uh, according uh, to the second book between uh, artists and women between art and women. Artists uh, are like women and, and so on. We can read uh, sentences like that in the second book. And uh, um, I think uh, we can see um, very good in, in section uh, 70 that uh, uh, you cannot uh, separate um, the, the two topics, art, artists and women, but uh, you have a, a very uh, close connection between them. And uh, the, the question um, uh, is, uh, or my question uh, is, uh, where can you find uh, the, the problem of, of knowledge, the um, epistemological problem of knowledge, uh, if I uh, understood your question right, uh, in this text, I, I cannot see it, um, yeah. to well, be honest. Thank you very much, but anyway, I, uh, I hope we have other opportunities to talk about because I'm convinced that mm -hmm. uh, uh, at least the first paragraphs of the second book of the gay science concern mm -hmm. concern epistemological, gnosiological uh, questions. Yes, anyway, the, I hope the, we have the first, some the first time sections, of course, uh, uh, I uh, I can uh, confirm this, but um, the uh, the section is. Um, um, in the, not in the beginning, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, section 70 and uh, the, the sections uh, before this uh, text um, are all about uh, women, about the relationship between men and women. And um, yes, you, you have to uh, consider um, the, the questions of, of knowledge um, um, with respect to, to, um, to the aesthetics, I think. Uh, to respect it to, I'm sorry, to respect it to the, to the sequence as a whole, mm -hmm. I think. The paragraphs uh, which come before the, sex, the, the, sec, uh, the sequence should be considered, in my view, mm -hmm. to understand the sequence as a whole. Not, specific, not specifically the, the paragraph 70, but all the sequence which begins with uh, the paragraph 57 till the paragraph 75. Mm -hmm. And uh, what would you uh, suggest how to read um, this section under the question of knowledge, the, under the question of aesthetical knowledge? Because the first, uh, the first uh, critic Nietzsche addresses in, the, in this book is to the realists, isn't it? Mm -hmm that Nietzsche opposing to, uh, that's what I'm going to present at, at two o'clock here in Brazil. <laughs> if you don't mind, we could um, continue to discuss later. Mm -hmm. Right? Thank right. you. Thank you. Thank you.